can you hear me okay i'm using an external um microphone <laughs> yeah no everything is good um what happened why why are we log i thought we said six o'clock isn't it your six o'clock yeah it's but it's oh i got so right now. i got so confused with the timing <laughs> <laughs> Cause like I was I was doing some work so so luckily like I'm I'm free right now too because like I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get you at any other time and then I got a notification saying that you entered the room and I was like what <laughs> wait let's, oh, let's jump so right sorry. on sorry um I got I got no, the time cool. change wrong. I got the time change wrong because I'm on Alberta yeah. time right. and I think that I just thought yeah. that you were on. It's cutting out now. Can you hear me? No, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, it's all good. Uh, my let me just try my video might stick a bit, but okay. your video is fine. Your video is working well and your audio is working well. Okay, I just can't hear you um, super clearly. Mm. I'm just going to quit some things. Uh, um, sure. I'm just gonna, my desktop is really busy right now, so that could be part of it. Um, All good. But yeah, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, went for a run today, and it was a really good run, but, so I use, I have like a, a run tracking app, mm -hmm. but then for some reason it didn't work today, so like, I had a really good run, but it didn't record my my distance, which, like, I, I know I'm working up for myself, but it's like, it's it's a little coach thing that keeps me motivated. Oh, so it's three it, it, it didn't know, it, yeah, it didn't know that I ran today, so now it's gonna be upset at me tomorrow uh... <laughs> when I go for my run again. <laughs> but. Oh. Um, so did you want to like Wait. do this now or did you want to do it at six? Cause I can do either. Cause I have to get a video in anyways. So either way it works for me. Um, no, this is, this is great. Yeah. Cool. Let's have some fun. Cool. Sweet. Ahem. Awesome. How's it going everybody? Welcome to the two degrees podcast brought to you by the play on foundation. And today's guest is doing a, incredible things on the front of indigenous representation and she is taking the world by storm from canada and her face just recently made it on to um l magazine alongside other indigenous creatives and i'm so thrilled to have her on today and it's marie casila Hey. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah. How was, um, tell me about L. That was a big surprise to see that pop up on your feed. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny because I'm sure you know in this industry, we do things months before they actually release, sometimes years. Mm -hmm. And so it's, we did this photo shoot. I think two months ago and then now it's obviously released and out in the world so that's great it's brought a lot of publicity my way which is really nice um, as an influencer the goal is always to gain more followers and reach more people um and so yeah it's been it's been awesome now as an influencer then what's what's the goal what's the main push for what it is that you're trying to promote and be an activist for my goal as an actress and everything that i do the continuous through line for all the work that i do is to raise awareness about indigenous rights issues and climate issues the climate issues is a new one um to come across in regards to uh, what I know from um, when we speak and so like what is it specifically about the climate issues where the world's getting too hot and then what does that affect on your end? Well it officially it, it greatly affects the northern communities 
the temperature of the climate. I mean, I'm no scientist, but um, it is affecting um, coastal coastlines um, across the world. Uh, and the polar bears up north, all the wildlife up north are being affected. Um, and that uh, is something that I'm really passionate about is raising awareness about um, climate change and indigenous rights issues in general. And I think that um, those kind of come hand in hand where the indigenous people are often at the forefront, um, at the front lines of these protests, um, fighting and protecting land, our land and, and really, which is all of anyone who's living on Canadian lands. Um, often it's the indigenous people that are uh, at the forefront of these protests. So um, I think that indigenous rights issues um, are often mixed and merged as um, climate change uh, issues as well. So I think they kind of go hand in hand and that's a lot of, that's where I find so much passion in the work that I do. Um, I'm always trying to reach more people uh, because the more people we reach the, the more of an impact I'm able to have. So uh, that's been my through line ever since I was a young girl. Uh, I went to Galapagos Islands when I was 15 or 16 with my mom and I was watching everything that Greenpeace was doing at the time and it really inspired me to do something uh, to better the world and to to take action um, in a positive direction and inspire others to do the same. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, speaking of Greenpeace, I just recently watched Angry Enough. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah and and it, it's just what what what's your take have you seen it yet i honestly haven't seen it yet um i okay i need to though <laughs> yeah no i think that one just based on the new information that i learned from it and the way it was put together i think it's probably my favorite um documentary to have ever come out because i just I've watched a lot of documentaries and I can't think of another one that kind of moved me the way Angry Enough did. And wow, but I can't wait to watch it. Watch it and yeah, and then I'd love to hear your thoughts on on um, on Greenpeace after that, just because I think it's very fascinating how it's how they're portrayed in that. Yeah. Um, cool. So with that and trying to garner more attention um as people trying to be allies then what would you say would be our best approach to help amplify indigenous voices i think there are things that are um pretty obvious so uh sharing indigenous made content uh, on social media platforms is probably one of the easiest ways to support and elevate Indigenous voices. Um, there, you can always support Indigenous-owned companies. That's that's another way that people can uh, actively support the Indigenous community. Um, and I think that it's so important. Equal representation is so important, and it's great to see that there are more high level, high up companies that are recognizing the importance of indigenous voices and highlighting them on big platforms. So I'm really hoping to see more of that moving forward. I'm torn in the state where I feel like especially trying to mail letters and and tag political leaders and and email political leaders feels like it gets nowhere so then is it more than just to focus on indigenous activists and continue spreading what they're spreading or do you think that there is some kind of fight within the parliament as well 
I think that it's great that Mary Simon got in as governor general. Uh, I think that that's definitely a start. Uh, I think that uh, the more political leaders that we have who are indigenous, the better. Uh, with that being said, it's hard to even get your foot in the door as, uh, as someone who's a politician and indigenous. Um, I think that one of the best ways for us to be noticed uh, is to create content um, that is shareable. Uh, a lot of um, one of the best ways to get knowledge out there is to create content that um, is understandable to many people by not using language that is too, um, I don't know, uh, hard to understand because the more people that can understand what you're saying, so what I try and do is I try and to use the sim most simple English language so that people who are not English speaking, they can understand it just as well as anyone else can, uh, because then you're able to share, you're able to reach more people. So I think that using um, not convoluted <laughs> terminology is really important. Um, and I think that it speaks volumes when these videos are able to reach uh, millions of views. I think that it's pretty hard for politicians, uh, for the government in general to ignore videos that are getting millions of views. And because that reflects directly what the people want to see. And so my hope is for, uh, for social media to continue to give us that freedom. Uh, there's some bills that are apparently potentially going to be passed in the next little while where um, TikTok and Instagram may have to purposely push certain content and not others, which mm. would really affect the... Uh, us as influencers um so that's a little bit nerve-wracking and my hope is that we're able to just express ourselves uh, with free speech and continue to do that in a way that is open and honest because when we get um shadow banned for example it's really discouraging as influencers uh and it, it's not motivating to continue to share edgy opinions and uh, or what might be perceived as edgy opinions that are maybe not necessarily um along with that go along with what the government wants or mm. uh, and so that can be a little bit nerve-wracking um i've been shadow banned in the past and even recently and it's not a good feeling it's really discouraging uh to feel like all the work that we're putting into something is purposely being suppressed yeah and it makes you question all like is is this really free speech if um if i'm being shadow banned or if anybody's being shadow banned like it's just annoying and i really really hope in the future i would like to see a platform that is truly free speech mm. um and um, I would love to see a company like Vice or someone put uh, a, a platform out there where we don't have to worry about getting shadow banned for speaking out about important Indigenous rights issues and climate change, climate change issues. As an influencer who's, who's really developed her stride um and gaining followers and followership have you come up with like a formula to avoid the shadow ban or do you just kind of have to hope that what you're posting doesn't offend the person who's there that's going to click that button to say you know this can't go well the algorithm picks up certain uh words there's words that are flagged that uh are words that you either have to block out in your video, uh, in the caption that you use, um, and or anything that you're saying. So a lot of it is about filtering the words that you're using in the video. 
and uh, mm. potentially some like sometimes I don't go as deep in the Instagram video, and then I'll release something on YouTube that goes deeper into that subject, just so that um, it, like it's not as I'm not as affected, or I hope not. Um, but recently I just got a screenshot from one of my followers and they couldn't follow me. Like they, they said like oh. they tried to follow me and it, uh, something popped up on the screen and said that you're not able to follow this person at this time for whatever reason. And, uh, it happened to my Instagram and my TikTok accounts simultaneously. They couldn't, uh, follow me. And then on TikTok, it said this person has too many community guideline violations that uh there was like a warning or something that came up with that which is really frustrating because mm -hmm. i don't post anything that is too edgy i would think i get <laughs> a lot of random videos taken down because of swords like sword stuff that i use for practicing like stunts and special skills like i was using this sword that was um plastic like a black plastic sword yeah, and it I've got taken that. down because so it was deemed as violent? I don't know. I read into the community uh, guideline violations and like what would be considered a violation. And it said something along the lines of like, you can't have anything that looks sharp. And I'm like, this isn't sharp. This is, <laughs> this is a black plastic <laughs> sword, <laughs> but whatever. Interesting. Um, yeah it has it like being an influencer definitely has its challenges but my goal right now is to cover more uh bases instead of just focusing on instagram and tiktok because if instagram and tiktok are monitoring content then i want to make sure that i have and i'm able to still spread uh use my voice to speak about important issues elsewhere and not just instagram and tiktok so is and that I think leading into your podcast then? Yes, exactly. So um, I Red Path Radio is my podcast. And so that is my goal is to be able to go more in depth about these issues um, and use my voice in that sense on my podcast and be more open that way. Um, and also on YouTube, I haven't really stepped into that realm yet, but my plan is to start to do that as well. And then people can find your podcast on Spotify, Apple, where else? Yeah, yeah all the major uh, platform or the streaming services. Okay, cool. And how, how have you found that transition so far? Because for especially me getting into this podcast, it got, it was, I don't know, there was, there was a, a level of stress because I had no idea what I was getting into and how to do it. So like, yeah. what, what was your, your <laughs> steps getting into it like? Um, it was probably just as stressful as, as you found it, just trying to figure out which platform to use. Uh, and I use Anchor, I find uh, that one is the easiest for me at least. Um, mm -hmm. But editing and using a total different platform and median going from voice or video to voice was just like so different and it takes way longer to edit uh a youtube or a podcast and it does a video like a 30 second video and yeah. so <laughs> having to listen to hour-long podcasts and go through it is a lot sometimes but it's also kind of cool because then you get a chance to relearn everything that 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 podcast uh, the content and the wisdom every, that was in that podcast. So it, it is good in a sense, but it's very time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've uh, gotten into a system where I'll listen to an episode and take like notes on it while I'm having breakfast and while I'm having like my, after my workout and I'm cooling down. Um, while I'm having like my shake or whatever, then I'll listen to another episode and take minutes and stuff like that. So then like, I'm nice. trying to bounce it out <laughs> where it's like, it fits into the day. So, but I, I get you on that. Like I envy 
those podcasters who have somebody on board who like takes minutes while the show is happening and yeah i i imagine that just flows so much easier <laughs> no kidding so where are you these days i'm currently in california just hanging what? out by the ocean. yeah let's see if i could there's a person there I don't wow know if let's see if i can looks uh, warm sh- there show you this view where in california what um yeah Ocean. it's called oceanside so i found this um neat little neighborhood that has like that entrance right to the ocean and wow. i've been here for three days now and they haven't kicked me out so nice. i'm enjoying this spot i'm gonna i'm gonna enjoy this spot till somebody says you have to move and then probably head up north to Huntington Beach or something or LA. But I'm avoiding the cold. Night. Don't get me wrong. I love yes. the cold. I love I love um snow and snow activities, but <sighs> I'm <laughs> I'm not a fan of the cold and I'm in the snow. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Don't feel bad about that. But even with that, like I guess yeah. you also have your dogs to enjoy it, because I know your dogs enjoy the cold for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The dogs <laughs> love the cold. Well, Kavik, he doesn't have like, cause both our Pomeranian or our Palm skis are half Pomeranian, half Husky. So Kavik is too. Uh, Kavik so has his little... No, he's tiny. Actually. He's 25 pounds. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He, he just looks like he's a big dog because he mm. looks like exactly like a husky but miniature and mm. whenever anybody meets him they're like whoa i thought he was a regular size husky but he's tiny That's um so, funny. so in pictures it's like deceiving because he looks mm. like a husky but no he's just tiny he's like these tiny little pomeranian feet so and his body's super furry so his <laughs> feet get really cold but he loves the snow yeah there's just something about huskies that it's it's natural to them. Like you can have a husky in the desert, and then as soon as you bring them up to somewhere where there's snow, they they just know how to play in it. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're awesome. I love I love them. It's it's great. I would <laughs> have all the huskies on the planet if I could. What do you do about all the shedding? The shedding, um, he, uh, I would say it mostly pops up in my vehicle. That's when I notice it the most, like in the summertime, like in the spring, it's crazy. Like I cannot have like lip gloss or anything on because when I put the windows down, it's just like fur everywhere. <laughs> That's so funny. So yeah, um, with, um, you're talking about how, um, you being an influencer and you have your goal with that and you're using acting as a big catalyst to help garner more followers um i remember us talking about um your role with justine trueblood Mm -hmm. and how you were mentioning how some people thought you were selling out because you were playing the cop role Yeah, there was a lot of backlash when I posted that picture of myself at the time. And there was uh, a lot of talk about cancel um, or defund the police around that Mm -hmm. time. And I think a lot of people thought that I was an actual police officer. (laughs) (laughs) And (laughs) because the costume is just so good and they didn't read the caption, like Mm -hmm. this is like me in wardrobe as a police yeah. officer <laughs> like playing Justine Trueblood in Tribal mm-hmm. and so yeah I got a lot of backlash when I posted that picture but I find that uh being somebody growing up in a primarily Caucasian small town I am used to backlash of some sort for pretty much everything that I did when I was younger and I I feel like that primed me to be an influencer because that 
kind of thing doesn't affect me as much as I think it would the average person person that may have been more sheltered to that. Um, so when I get that kind of negative feedback, I, I try not to take it to heart, but sometimes I think it mostly affects me if it's like, if it's somebody that I grew up with, but when it's just random people behind a keyboard, it doesn't affect me too much. <laughs> I just block yeah. them right away. <laughs> I'm like, bye. <laughs> Fair. Um, have you like been in any situation where a comment just like a negative comment especially stood out that kind of rocked you or were you just always good at ignoring the negative i think it depends on where i'm at uh personally in my personal life like if i'm feeling kind of down that day for whatever reason and then i read a comment that is triggering then it affects me more um there's been comments in the past where it just kind of like bugs me all day. Um, but that doesn't happen often any, anymore. I think that's only really happened a couple times. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say when it really affects me is, is really only when it's people that, that I grew up with. And for whatever reason, they feel the need to say something to me. And mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of more so when it gets to me but I try not to I mean I like I try not to let it affect me too much because I think it says more about that person than anything else and yeah, I yeah. try and always just I try and always just wish them love and uh as hurtful as that as those things can be just continue to show them love and uh yeah that has that's been the way that I've kind of mitigated um, that kind of energy throughout my life, I've learned that the more uh, the the more you fight back, often say for in a bullying situation, say somebody is saying really awful things to you, and even if it's in in real life, the more you're just like, I hope you like, I hope like. I hope that you feel better after saying that or like like does that make you feel better and like mm -hmm. asking that and saying like i wish you the best like i love you anyways even though like you feel this way i i love you and i care about you and i wish the best for you and like the more that you say that the more that you just fight them with love and like ask them like did that make you feel better? Like, I don't know like what you're trying to do here, but um, it's not gonna, it's not affecting me. And like, I just wish the best for you. Um, yeah. And like truly meaning that, like really truly meaning like in coming at it with love, I think is the best way to fight that kind of energy. And that's, that's the kind of energy that I try and meet those people with. Uh, cause I think it makes them question more like, why am I acting this way? Why am I acting out like this? And it makes it, it turns it around on them. And then it gives them the opportunity to, to address that within themselves. Hmm. And I think so that is important. With that, you have to have a lot of conviction in order to take that strategy of dealing with bullies in in a live situation as well and growing up in Canada there's just way too much racism to ignore where did you mm -hmm. gain that conviction how did you become so resilient because I used to uh, in in middle school and high school, I always used I I was used to standing up for myself in a way of like more aggressively standing up for myself. I'd say more so being like all tough about it and like acting all tough about it, and it wasn't working. Mm. And what I what I realized was it was just feeding it. Like the more, like the more tough I was appearing, the more people wanted to come at me for whatever reason. 
and the more they wanted to prove that um that I wasn't perfect when nobody's perfect or prove that whatever x y and z and what I real I don't know how I realized this but I just one day I was thinking I was like this is not working like standing up for myself in this kind of tough way I think can serve people I think it can probably save people and uh create boundaries and I think there's a time and a place for that but for me what I learned was the way that I was standing up for myself was actually creating it was actually making them want to come at me even more and so Mm -hmm. I thought what if I just literally kill them with kindness and so I just started smiling at people um, who were saying mean things to me in the hallway for example and just like laughing it off instead of um instead of saying something back or trying to be all tough about it Mm -hmm. and so because i found that was like egging them on even more and and what i realized is the more love that i just gave to them the more i was like (laughs) okay (laughs) like i hope i hope that makes you feel better Mm. and and just saying just like literally laughing it off and smiling um like was what really stopped uh that kind of energy in my life and uh, like in the real life mm-hmm. like in the um like when it came to school high school days and whatnot and i think that it also turns it around on them and then it makes it very obvious in the situation if you're a bystander like who has the real issue yeah like if somebody's like yelling something rude at at a girl who's smiling and laughing it off it's very obvious as to like who has the issue there you know yeah. <laughs> so um i just found and i i find um like even online the more people try and say mean things or rude things the more i'm like you know i i like even though like that was rude i still care about you and i wish the best for you the more you're just kill them with kindness the better yeah how do you go about you just have less to deal with i find no that's fair yeah how do you go about recharging because to carry that to carry a smile i've learned can be exhausting and when you just have to constantly kill people with kindness that smile then turns into a very reliable weapon but to wear it is taxing at times for myself I don't know about if that's the same for you. Um, I personally think that wearing a smile is only taxing if it's not genuine. Mm. And if you're coming from a genuine place of like, I think, yeah, I think that like, it is really easy to wear yourself out if you're, if you're putting on this, like this joyful demeanor, I think. And I've been there, I've been like, I've been super depressed before where like just smiling is even hard. Yeah. Um, but I find that the more solid you are, the, the happy you, happier you are, the more aligned with your, your purpose and um, with what brings you joy in life, the easier it is to brush that kind of thing off. Mm. I feel that. So at what point then do you, like, does it, does it stop in regards to being nice? Because do, do you have a limit? Have you reached that limit or are you just always smiling? Because let's say you're put in a situation where it's just ignorant people and it's day after day after day do you I just, just block avoid them. that or yeah i just literally block them out of my life like hmm. i uh i've i've had to block people um people that that were previously really close to me uh but when somebody is just constantly meeting you with just negativity every single day 
um, you have to protect yourself and do what is best for you and say like I in that situation I actually had to do that recently um, and it, which was really unfortunate because uh, I really care about this person um, and I just had to say you know thank you for teaching me everything that you taught me I wish the best for you but I have to block you um, mm -hmm. and um, I just hope that you know that I truly wish the best for you and then block on all platforms <laughs> Wow! Yeesh. like if somebody is uh, is continuously being like that um, yeah that's what I've learned I've, I've had to do and sometimes like they can be ruthless I've had to block people on email before like huh. it like not only on Instagram and TikTok and that, but like it gets to the point sometimes when they're just like emailing you too. It's like, it's, and it's not, and, and to take that and let it go when, especially when it's somebody like you, uh, you care about. Um, but sometimes like they're just going through something and projecting stuff onto you and it's not right. And I don't, mm. and I think that establishing your boundaries is really important. Um, I'm very good at that. Uh, I feel like I establish my boundaries like Beyonce would, and <laughs> I know what I deserve. And I know, like, I, I don't want anyone in my life that is not benefiting me in, in providing love and light and if they're not providing love and light to me if they're being destructive or purposely trying to be destructive in my life it's like i can't deal with that and yeah. i don't deserve to either and yeah. like we're all just trying to do our best out here nobody's perfect um but i'm i'm very good at politely but sternly establishing my boundaries and didn't, and I know what I deserve. I know how I deserve to be treated. And when I'm not treated that way, I don't have any patience with that because time is more valuable than anything. And yeah. wasting your time worrying about how someone feels about you, I think is, is a waste of time because they should be worrying about themselves. And I often think like people that I've had to block out of my life, I'm doing them a favor because for whatever reason, they're obsessing over um, whatever it is at the time. And I'm like, I block them often so that they're able to, to focus on themselves. Yeah. Like I, uh, and, and it's crazy. Like how many I haven't had to do that much haven't have haven't had to do that that much but it sucks like when you when you do have to but it's i think it's so important for us to to know our boundaries and to state our boundaries um in in a confident manner and but also just wish them love at the same time it's like it's nothing it's it's this is just a situation this is what i know i deserve you and like this is for the best yeah and yeah i mean it's just part of life it's part of being an influencer it's a part of being in the spotlight um there's a lot of jealousy in um in this industry unfortunately uh, and sometimes you can't always see it firsthand yeah a lot I of agree. people like to mask that like that with really um excessive like uh, I love you. You're so amazing. This and that and this and that. And, and <laughs> behind closed doors, they're saying something else to someone and it's just like, it's yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's um, the, the glitz and glam of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, now you talked about being under the spotlight and that being like a, a consequence or or the other side of being in the spotlight do you ever take time then or how is it trying to take time for yourself especially 
being an activist and trying to maintain, you know, new, the news for and spreading the news and spreading the word for everybody. How is it trying to take time off? It's, it feels really hard and almost impossible to take time off at times. I think that most entrepreneurs are affected with the same kind of bug where you feel like you can always be doing something and technically you can always be working on something. Uh, and so I find as an actress and an influencer, there's litter and, and a business owner, uh, there's literally always something that I could be doing. And so I just try and I just try my best to have a solid routine and and make sure to get everything that I need to get done for myself in the mornings before I do anything else. And um, that's what I have found the most freedom in is making sure that I take care of myself first and then yeah. then I can like let the day run its course and get all the work I need to done. But it's definitely hard to relax and put stuff to the side sometimes because often it's urgent and they need an answer right then and there, or you end up missing out on, op on an opportunity. And yeah. it's hard to keep up with, but uh, I have a manager now, which is really great. Um, he's awesome. And he's he's been such a big help for for me in that sense. So that's been giving me some more time to, to work on myself and to focus more on the creative aspect of things. Mm -hmm. So with that, because as I mentioned before, you're, you're snowballing into a new level of influencer, I should say. Um, and that's, that's reflected by your follower account because it's, it's just going up and up and up um what's next for you well actually it's interesting uh, i get that question a lot um and i love it because what's next is the documentary that i am uh producing and directing it's the first project that i've actually produced and directed myself so i'm kind of stepping into that uh role which has been interesting and has taught me a lot about the industry in general so far, but the premise of it is what's next on Canada's red path to reconciliation. So my goal is to interview as many indigenous community leaders, influencers and elders to get their opinions on what they think we need to do to move forward in the best way possible. And my goal is to create a hub where people can go to, to learn about what's going on in Canada right now and to get firsthand opinions on how Canadians can help towards moving uh, forward in a good way and towards reconciliation. Have you already started filming? So we're in, we're probably, our goal is to start filming July 1st on, okay. for the next Cancel Canada Day um, protest yeah. and then <laughs> filming likely all <laughs> and then likely filming all summer um yeah and then releasing hopefully in november of this year as well yes wow. yeah so it's gonna be intense <laughs> yeah that's gonna be uh... <laughs> november december we'll see Ooh, that's that <laughs> what's uh what's what are some things or have you already started facing any hurdles and in terms of being a producer because for me personally as a filmmaker producer is one thing that i do not want to touch i'll write i'll direct i'll executive produce but i'll for me producing is just too tedious because there's so many moving parts and i can't keep up <laughs> yeah so i'm actually looking for I'm, I'm actually looking for uh some more producers to bring onto the team because there's just so much work mm. so um if you know anyone out there, let me know. Uh, I would like to just take some of the load off my back because it is so much work. And since it's my first uh, project, I, I would love to more so just shadow someone and oversee all the creative development of it. Yeah. 
Um, so it's been interesting. It's been great because I've been, I have so much support from other producers, uh, a production company, um, and also uh, Gwyn Communications, which has been a huge help in order, like in regards to grants and whatnot. So I, I have a lot of people on my side that really want to help me and see this come to fruition. So uh, luckily, I have a lot of people that are on my side for this. And uh, so, yeah, hopefully we can get it out sooner than later because it's a heavy topic and it weighs really heavy on me because uh, my dad went to residential school for 13 years along with uh, my aunts and uncles and so when the news came out recently or last year about all the residential school uh, children being found um, it was it weighed really heavy on me and it, it affected me more than I thought it would uh, and it made me re realize how the residential school system has affected me on a daily basis up until this point every single day it affects me and my mental health in particular. Um, I'm very, I'm clinically OCD. And so it's been interesting to see how that relates to the residential school system. Um, and yeah, I'll talk, I'll be talking more in depth about that in the documentary um, and more so going into like the personal, like how it has personally affected me. Um, but yeah, it's been challenging. It's been a really good learning experience though as well. And there's been so far a lot of healing that has come with it too. That's awesome. That's beautiful. Um, how then in your eyes, flipping the question to you, what then would you say is the next steps in reconciliation from your perspective? I think that healing is the most important part of reconciliation and connecting with our culture and bringing back ceremony, I think are the most important aspects, um, along with seeking justice. And I would like to see all of, all of the names released from all of the schools across Canada in uh, who was involved with the schools. And I think that anyone who's still living needs to go to trial for it. Um, that's what I would like to see. Um, and I think that funding, and I know that funding has been, in, in some cases on some reservations, government funding has been going to the indigenous community to do research so that they can do the ground penetrating radar. Mm. Um, and so that's been good and an important step to that. Uh, that's challenging. It's hard. I know as, uh, in being indigenous myself and being friends with so many other indigenous influencers, um, it's, it's tough to think of, uh, like when they're going to be looking at your parents residential school like when when is the day going to come when they are searching your for example my dad's residential school grounds and that's a scary thought um and uh it's it's challenging but uh this is all knowledge like we've known in the indigenous community for forever uh, we've known that children were going missing um and we've known these these stories for forever but it's interesting like seeing the actual numbers um that's been challenging but i've just been trying to focus more so myself on the healing aspect of it all and and facing that side um and trying to put healing above all else no that's fair and I, I send all of my energy and, and prayers into hoping that you attain this goal um, through your documentary, through your podcast, through spreading the word, through your influencing. Um, 
but even specifically through your influencing and and your your ambition to take all of these like a a front of camera approach where your face and you are the medium of this message at what point did you know you had a voice Hmm. i connect with my spirituality as much as i possibly can on a daily basis i feel like i uh, don't really have a choice when it comes to like to my spirituality i pretty much have one foot in spirit spirit realm 100 percent of the time and it can be really overwhelming at times uh i i get lots of visions um messages from the creator uh and it can be really overwhelming and hard to navigate especially when a lot of this knowledge and how to handle this type of connection to the spirit world uh this knowledge would have been taught to us in ceremony and it would have been passed down to us through uh, our parents and our grandparents Um, but being so disconnected from ceremony and from that knowledge and not knowing how to navigate the spirit world has been really challenging um, because when you're in it, whether you like it or not, um, like not having a solid foundation and the knowledge to navigate that world can be really challenging. And um, so I've been really just learning, trying to learn as much, as much about that and how to navigate that world as much as possible, because whether I like it or not, I have one foot in the spirit world all the time, no matter what. And it can be super overwhelming, especially just being out in the world, doing what I'm doing. Um, and, and so I think that's also one of the reasons why it's so important to bring back ceremony and to try uh, to bring back that knowledge and to spread awareness about that knowledge. Because I think a lot of people who are, are uh, not connected in that way don't know what it's like to be um, connected spiritually um, in that sense. And it may seem like it's great and airy fairy and it can be, and it can it's so beautiful and I'm so grateful for it. Uh, but it can be really overwhelming at times. So learning how yeah. to navigate that is important. And I'd say one of the reasons why I know that I have that awareness that I have a voice um, is because of that connection to the creator. Uh, and I've, I've been getting messages a lot, especially the past couple of years to, to use my voice and how important it is for me to continuously just use my voice and share my opinions. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'd say the only reason I know that is because I'm, uh, I, I continuously get that message in numerous ways, um, mostly just from meditating. And that's really how I connect mostly with my spirituality these days is through meditation. And I have a big belief that the deeper you go into your mind, uh, the closer you get to the wisdom of your ancestors. Mm. And do you have um, anybody teaching you or guiding you through all of this? Or is this just a self journey that you this is me you're... just remembering and like it's me knowing that when i look at my hands i am my ancestors and that knowledge is passed down through ancestral dna and um and so when i meditate um i listen and I'm trying to figure out and connect with the creator and listen to what is coming up into my, um, into my awareness. And a lot, a lot of the times like these, um, messages just come out of the blue. And so that's when I know that it's not me that is, um, 
coming up with this. It's, it's a message from my ancestors or it's a message from the creator. And I only yeah. know this because um, I've been connected spiritually since I was a young girl and I never really understood it. Um, but I've had to manage it uh, throughout my entire life. And I grew up in Canmore, Alberta, which is 40 hours away from my traditional territory. So my traditional territory, if for anyone who's listening, is on the coast of the Arctic Ocean um, on the, in, in Western Canada. So basically as far north as you can go until you hit the Arctic Ocean from here. And so I grew up very far from my uh, culture and uh so reconnecting with that has been challenging um my dad after residential school came down here uh to give to start a new life because as many of you know life on the reserve can be really challenging and although it can be really beautiful to be on your traditional territory you can be uh, and that's closer to the knowledge there's also benefits to to moving away from from that for a certain amount of time. Now I'm more drawn to going back and spending more time on our traditional land. Um, but yeah, it's more so been me trusting my own instincts and remembering um, all of this. So I haven't had anybody guiding me. I've just been reaching for any kind of knowledge, uh, whether that's through Buddhism or Christianity or uh, like literally anything that is teaching me about the universe and the creator and, and God, like yeah. literally anything that is, that I'm able to learn from, I go to. Um, and I would say yeah. that's where the deepest healing has uh, come for me is going uh, in depth, learning about my spirituality and, that's how I felt this, this hole I feel like I had in my heart for a long time. Uh, that's how I, I filled myself up um, and got back, got to where I am now is by really paying attention to my spiritual side and going in depth into that, but also learning more about quantum physics and the law of attraction too. <laughs> which is a whole Jeez. other thing but is it really I, at the same time <laughs> i um i'm reading a book right now um autobiography of a yogi and he talks about similar journey of trying to get in touch with the spirituality and and seeking a teacher for this and in the way that he described it where his teacher was really helpful in finding all the loose ends like you're you're already doing all the work but then it's like okay you just need to figure out so i i hope you 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 do you know make that solid connection and are able to put both feet into the spiritual world when when you feel because i i think that you have such a powerful voice and I am excited to, you know, just be there when it's like, when that voice just turns into like a, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, 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 okay. yeah, it's, it's, it's when like the voice turns into now the voice in everybody's head. Mm. where I feel is yeah where I feel like you're making that connection because even though it's just numbers on a social media account the fact that what you've done in the time that you've done it is just a reflection of you're on the right path mm. thank so you I, I, I do that. wish you all the best with that Thank you. And um, but on the on the on the topic of you mentioning um, the region where Inuit live, being the Arctic Circle, and when I was watching the documentary, 
um, I was fascinated by the tattoos. And you, every now and then, you you do the tattoos in in your videos, mm -hmm. but then it's more specifically to the ones along the wrists mm -hmm. and seeing that. And it's like it's it's the same symbols. Yeah. So it's like I'm I'm fascinated now too to learn the history and and the ancestry because there's there's something to be said about coastal region tribal cultures where mm -hmm. I'm watching like the documentary and I'm seeing families and I'm like, I see my family in this. I see, I see my, my grandparents, I see my aunts and uncles. So it's like, what is the relationship between Inuit people and Polynesians and, and Hawaiians well, and Filipinos? Like, so. Did I if, tell if you, you, if you, do you have, know that I'm, do you know that I'm like one sixteenth uh, Fijian? Really? <laughs> I see it. Yeah. I, see, I see it. So yeah. like there's there's something and I am I'm hoping to get the time to deep dive into into that ancestry because and it it's it's through the ink too. Like this is Filipino and then I have another one that's from Polynesia and I have another one that's from Hawaii and I have another one that's from New Zealand with the Maldi people and then okay. seeing the lines and the tattoos and in Inuit culture, I'm just like, what is, what's the relationship here? And yeah, I find it so fascinating where in both cultures, they're, they're, the resilience of being in a place that it took a long time for the white man to get to because they were just afraid of the terrain. And then yeah. that's just where we thrived, where it's like, you know, it thrived in the uh -huh. cold and you had your, your oceanic people surviving on these islands that you could only navigate to if you knew the waters. And it's like the white people just couldn't get there because they, they just <laughs> didn't have the technology at the time. So that's, that's I think, going to be like my next deep dive is figuring out um, when the breaks happened mm -hmm. where it's like did everybody go north first and then a lot of people said it was cold and then went down and then the Inuit stayed or mm -hmm. did everything start like around Polynesia and then we everybody went north and then it was just the Inuits that kept going further north and well, so my my theory and I'm no historian or anyone or anything so um mm -hmm. but with the inuit people apparently were at war with the cree people for however many years centuries probably um and thinking about how the cree people were uh the biggest tribe pretty much still are in north america um the inuit people from what i from <laughs> from my own thinking, um, we're likely pushed north because we were at war with the Cree people. So we like naturally you'd think that we'd want to stay away from the biggest tribe in North America. Um, and so yeah. I think that's just my theory, but like I said, I'm no historian yeah. or anything. Um, and I also heard, and I, from what I know, apparently, uh, we walked across the land bridge from Mongolia. So uh, the Inuits have uh, apparently a lot of Mongolian blood. And so I wonder mm -hmm. if the Polynesians are connected to Mongolia as well. Yeah. Which would make sense to me. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm so curious to explore all of that when I get the time to, for sure. But it would be cool to that documentary on one of our podcasts. <laughs> yeah no for real and i was looking up stuff the other day too just like trying to figure out what kind of university classes there are revolving around that specific topic of tattoos and the yeah. connection between polynesian culture and inuit culture totally so hopefully i'm one so day. tempted to get yeah, face tattoos we'll do it 
oh man you would you would just be completely badass and you never know that can also be something that helps you with your spiritual journey because yeah tattoos have power yeah but uh marika this has been an absolute pleasure and when you get some more time please let me know and we'll film some more and we'll we'll chop it up and do some more catching up but this was incredible so thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me this time and for sharing your kind words you're amazing oh well i really really appreciate it it was awesome to see your face again and enjoy your time in california safe travels and thank you so much for having me on my pleasure my pleasure but everybody, thank you all for tuning in to the Two Degrees Podcast brought to you by the Play On Foundation for Brain Aneurysm Prevention and Detection Research. This is Marika Sila, and please, please, please check her out and her podcast and get her subscription, not subscription, but get her edition of Elle Magazine because it's with her alongside, is it three other indigenous uh, voices? Yes. You have... Um, yes. Uh, Willow Allen, Shina Nova, and Victoria. Mm. Uh, I can't, I don't know her, the pronunciation of her last name, but she's the designer of Victoria's Arctic Fashion. Is that the one that's, that's in conjunction with, uh, is it Canada Goose? Or North yes, Face? yes, it's a, a, a Tiggy project, um, and which is great. Oh, nice. uh, it's sold out apparently, so We've been getting a lot of support from the community and really the world. It's been crazy. Um, and uh, a lot of those proceeds go towards the indigenous community, uh, which is great. And yeah, so um, you can follow me, Marie Casilla, on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, and thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And I can't wait to have you back. Awesome. But for everybody, stay safe and mag-ingat kayo.